Kompau. How are you? Well, hi, Brother Kompau. I'm fine. Today's date is June 17th, 2019, and we are continuing with our study in the book of Ezra. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, last week we had finished off at uh, verse 44. Right. Where uh, the Ezra, the Ezra, I combined Ezra with Uriel. We called him Ezra. <laughs> My goodness, my goodness, where Uriel had told Ezra, now Uriel is the angel who's a messenger of God, Mm -hmm. so he'll speak in the first person as God as he's the messenger. He says, this is my judgment and its prescribed order, and to you alone have I shown these things. And uh, if you didn't listen to last week's show, please listen to it. Listen to all of them. You just got to play catch up if you haven't, because it's just been really, really good. It's foundational, and the thing is, if you just come in on this one, you're you're going to miss a lot. Mm-hmm. A lot of good stuff. What we're seeing here is that it's uh, very Christ centric. Yeah, uh, everything points to Messiah and points to the sovereignty of God and His plan for mankind. And you begin to see the beauty of these things when you strip away man's doctrines and you strip away man's traditions, what we thought about things, and see the the pureness of it. Mm-hmm. of truth and it's absolutely gorgeous yep the simplicity of the gospel yes absolutely amazing mm-hmm. so we're going to start today we're going to do go from verse 45 through 75 mm-hmm. and i'm going to have miss kapowness read those verses okay to you all right and then we're going to go back and we're going to break them down probably sentence by sentence or something like that Mm-hmm. All right, it's going to be beautiful. So, if you're ready, Miss Capel, I'm ready. Go get them. It says, I answered and said, Oh, sovereign Lord, I said then and I say now, Blessed are those who are alive and keep thy commandments. But what of those who, for whom I prayed? For who among the living is there that has not sinned? Or who among men that has not transgressed thy covenant? And now I see that the world to come will bring, will bring bring delight to few but torments to many for an evil heart has grown up in us which has alienated us from god and has brought us into corruption and the ways of death and has shown us the paths of perdition and removed us far from life and that not just a few of us but almost all who have been created he answered me and said listen to me ezra and i will instruct you and will admonish you yet again For this reason the Most High has made not one world, but two. And whereas you have said that the righteous are not many, but few, while the ungodly abound, hear the explanation for this. If you have just a few precious stones, will you add to them lead and clay? I said, Lord, how could that be? And he said to me, Not only that, but ask the earth, and she will tell you. Defer to her, and she will declare it to you. Say to her, You produce gold and silver and brass, and also iron and lead and clay. But silver is more abundant than gold, and brass than silver, and iron than brass, and lead than iron, and clay than lead. Judge therefore which things are precious and desirable, those that are abundant or those that are rare. And I said, O sovereign Lord, what is plentiful is of less worth, for what is more rare is more precious. And he answered me and said, Weigh within yourself what you have thought, for he who has what is hard to get rejoices more than he who has what is plentiful. So also will be the judgment which I have promised, for I will rejoice over the few who shall be saved, because it is they who have made my glory prevail now, and through them my name has now been honored, and I will not grieve over the multitude of those who have perished or who perish, for it is they who are now like a mist and and are similar to a flame and smoke. They are set on fire and burn hotly and are extinguished. And I replied and said, O earth, what have you brought forth if the mind is made out of the dust like the other created things? For it would have been better if the dust itself had not been born so that the mind might not have been made from it. But now the mind grows with us, and therefore we are tormented, because we perish and know it. 
Let the human race lament, but let the beasts of the field be glad. Let all who have been born lament, but let the four-footed beasts and the flocks rejoice. For it is much better with them than for us, for they do not look for a judgment, nor do they know of any torment or salvation promised to them after death. For what does it profit us that we shall be preserved alive but cruelly tormented? For all who have been born are involved in iniquities and are full of sins and burdened with transgressions. And if we were not to come into judgment after death, perhaps it would have been better for us. And he answered me and said, When the Most High made the world and Adam and all who have come from him, he first prepared the judgment and the things that pertain to the judgment. And now understand from our own words, for you have said that the mind grows with us. For this reason, therefore, those who dwell on the earth shall be tormented, because though they had understanding, they committed iniquity, and though they received the commandments, they did not keep them. And though they obtained the law, they dealt unfaithfully with what they had received. What then will they have to say in the judgment, or how will they answer in the last times? For how long the time is that the Most High has been patient with those who inhabit the world, and not for their sake, but because of the times which he has foreordained. I answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O Lord, show this also to thy servant, whether after death, as soon as every one of us yields up his soul, we shall be kept in rest until those times come when thou wilt renew the creation, or whether we shall be tormented at once. Okay. And um, what we're going to find out here is that this is true biblical prophecy in the sense that it helps unlock the keys to our Bible and to our scriptures. And what it does is it cuts through man's doctrine and tradition and absolutely some things that are doctrines of demons, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're not just, oh, let's see, you know, a misinterpretation of things, but whole systems have been developed around lies that are not biblical and they put the focus back on man and take it away from, from God. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> so we've been kind of dealing with this through the whole series about, you know, the, the prophecy in the end times. And we'll see it again today. The other thing that we'll notice is that there's no humanitarian, um, humanism here. Uh, we're like all good dogs go to heaven, you mm-hmm. know, uh, just because your neighbor is a good egg doesn't mean they're going to go to heaven. Even 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 if they're going to church and they're carrying their Bible, they do Bible studies. You know, they appear to be Christian. The whole bit doesn't mean they're they're getting eternal life mm-hmm. just because they're a good egg. God has specific requirements, uh, and every, all those requirements are through Messiah. That's right. Belief, faith, pistis in Messiah a reliance and a trust on Messiah and what God has done. All those requirements and a renewing of the spirit. So just because somebody's a good egg, they're a good person. The other thing that is really important is that the emphasis on our right relationship with the Lord God at all times and the the importance of um, spiritual warfare and putting on the whole armor of God. Yes, and you emphasized at all times. Mm-hmm. So it's not just when you get saved and then later on you become a seasoned, mature Christian and kind of kick back a little bit because you know mm-hmm. a lot. That's not the case at all. Mm-hmm. It's, it is a constant war. It's a constant battle because you're battling your flesh as well as the world and as well as the Satans That's right. around you. And you're, it's a triangle. It's an evil triangle that you're battling. Mm-hmm. And if uh, Satan's not trying to get you and the world's not trying to influence you your own flesh is tearing you apart that's right and so you um you you become renewed in spirit through the spirit of christ Mm -hmm. and and uh it is at all times it's constant it's 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 a lifestyle so that you can have eternal life Mm -hmm. so it's you're going to see god answer these questions these almost humanistic questions uh, where ezra's asking well what about everybody else you know, how could this be? Mm-hmm. And he explains it because he's a righteous and just God. And he explains why 
the, the vast majority of people won't be saved. They could be saved. They can be saved. That's right. But they won't be. Why won't they be? Because they choose not to be. <laughs> That's the only reason. Mm-hmm. They choose not to be. They choose not to come to God through Messiah. So they're not. That's the vast majority of people. It's not because they're, they're born and they're dedicated to be that way. We've all, we'll find here in this study, we're all, we've all sinned. We've all been born into sin. Mm-hmm. It is the conscious choice to have faith in Messiah. So that's, that's the overview of it. So let's uh, get into it. <clears throat> so uh, verse 45, I answered and said, O sovereign Lord, I said then and I say now, this is Ezra talking, blessed are those who are alive and keep thy commandments. Mm-hmm. So he's right. He's like, even today, blessed are those people who who are living right now and are keeping God's commandments. Blessed are they. Mm-hmm. And he says in verse 46, but what of those for whom I prayed? Because Ezra prayed for the lost. He says, for who among the living is there that has not sinned or who among men has not transgressed, right? Mm-hmm. So he says, you know, blessed are th- those who have found you now this is this is pre Christ, remember. This is under the law. Ezra's writing this under Babylonian captivity, under the law and under the commandments, the Mosaic law. And so he's saying, you know, blessed are those who are doing that, but what about those who, who aren't? You know, how, how, how are they gonna be judged? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so let's go to um, the fact that all have sinned. And this is why the atoning work of Messiah is so vital. Having faith in Christ isn't just a good idea. And it's not so you can just be a good person. It's vital. It's vital. Mm -hmm. It's vital for eternal life. So if you'll read Romans 3, 21 through 29. Okay. But now, apart from the law of, um, I'm sorry, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as appropriation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is it God, or is or is God the God of Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. So right there, Paul is is clearly stating that God's righteousness is tied up in Messiah. It's about all of us, every single person, then and now, have been born into sin, and God providing that propitiation for sin, that shedding of the blood. Mm. He has provided the way out of this matrix, of the satanic system of the world. He's provided a way to defeat the rulers of the and powers of the air. Yes, he's provided an escape. An escape, I like that. He's provided an escape. And... Um, so it's clear that that's Paul is is saying this just like the angel Uriel is answering Ezra when he says who among men has not transgressed thy covenant and Paul is as some uh 400 years later answering that but here here's the answer here also in Ezra verse 47 it says and now I see that the world to come, he's talking about eternal life, right? The world to come, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, 
uh, Ezra sees this. And he says, now I see that the world to come will bring delight to few, but torments to many. Mm. So at this time, Ezra, his heart is breaking because he's, he sees so many people that have transgressed God's covenant and don't follow God. And he's asking, well, what about them? Mm-hmm. He says, I see eternal life, and I, but I, for, for a few people who, who are believing and they're blessed, but I see these, these torments to the rest of the people and it's breaking my heart, man. Mm-hmm. He's having a hard time understanding that. Now, he's, all this is gonna be explained to him, but right now he's asking those very questions that many of us have asked. Mm-hmm. And may still be asking now, you know, how could a loving God send so many people to hell? You know, mm-hmm. how could all these people be wrong, Ms. Kapow? Mm-hmm. The Catholics and the Mormons and they're all good people. How could they be wrong? Well, like he says, who among, who among the men that get that new world are few, but many are torments. Mm. So if you go to Matthew 7, 13 through 14, it talks about the narrow gate. Yep. And it reads, <coughs> Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. So right there, the Messiah himself has said the same thing. It's a narrow, narrow path. Mm-hmm. The way to torment and to hell is broad and big, and there's many walking there. But but the way to to eternal life is is hard. It's a narrow little gate. Mm-hmm. And Jesus even said that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the way I like to look at it is Jesus is the way to the truth, which brings life. And Jesus is the actual doorway into this narrow road. Mm, and he go. says, follow me. Mm-hmm. The actual door. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not for the many because they won't find it. They can find it. It's not impossible for them to find it, but they won't find it. Verse 48 says, for an evil heart, mm-hmm. Ezra's still talking, He says, for an evil heart has grown up in us, which has alienated us from God and has brought us into corruption and the ways of death Mm. and has shown us the paths of perdition and removed us far from life. He's talking eternal life. Mm. And that not just a few of us, but almost all who have been created so this is Ezra's lament right here. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, he's kind of thinking like a humanist. What about the rest of the people? And I'm not saying don't have compassion on people. Oh, you, no. you need to have compassion on people mm-hmm. because God has compassion on them and he wants them to come to truth in Messiah. He wants them to come to knowledge of him. And that's why he said that he loved the people of the world so much that he he gave his only begotten son, the only son begotten of God. God made flesh on this earth to become a sacrifice for their redemption. That's how much he loves them. So when I say humanism, I'm talking about that all good dogs go to heaven kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. You know, because my neighbor pays his taxes and he doesn't get tickets. He's a good egg. He's a good guy. Um, you know, yep. that's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so Ezra's saying, you know, all humans have an evil heart. Yeah, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. And it's by God's mercy, his grace, that we were even saved. Amen. Like back to Romans again, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, we look at evil heart. There's a reference here in Genesis 6, 5 through 6. And it reads, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. This, to me, this, to me, for me, this is the saddest 
scripture in our in all of our, our Bible mm-hmm. that it repented the Lord that He had made man on earth. That to me, that's just that's the saddest scripture ever written. Definitely. And this this incident here of this scripture comes right after. The daughters, the sons of God mated with the daughters of men and, and created the Nephilim on, on the earth. And uh, giants, men of renown, who then mated, you know, corrupted everything. And God's, God says that, that humans were just wicked after that. And every imagination of their thoughts was just evil all the time, continually. Mm-hmm. And uh, so this comes right before he destroys that world that we knew with the flood. And only Noah and his uh, eight, eight people together were saved from that. Mm-hmm. And we all descended from Noah and his sons. Um, so it shows that, you know, Ezra's saying an evil heart's grown up with us. It's been from the very beginning. So when you're looking at humans or humanistic thought, we're all evil. Just mm-hmm. like Romans says, all have sinned and come short of God's honor. In other words, God's glory. What what God would honor in a person. We're very short of that. Mm-hmm. And not just a few, but almost all who have been created, he exclaims. So the angel answers Ezra and says, Listen to me, Ezra. I will instruct you. Mm-hmm. I will admonish you yet again. I got to tell you again, verse 50, for this reason, the most high has made not one world, but two. Mm -hmm. What he's talking about there is he's made heaven and hell, torment and eternal life. There's two worlds. Okay. This thing that we're living in now is a phony matrix created by the fallen angel. (laughs) The real stuff is is out there later on. Mm -hmm. The unseen, which Mm -hmm. is eternal. Absolutely. Here and there. So if you'll read Matthew 25, 45. Oh, you know what? I don't have that one. Oh, well, I will then. It says, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did not to one of the least of these, um, ye did it not to me. That is coming right where he's separating the sheep and the goats. Mm -hmm. And he sends them into eternal torment. And there were gnashing, a darkness gnashing of teeth. That's that world. There's two worlds. That's that world they're sent to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mark 10, 17 says, and when he has gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Mm-hmm. That's the other world. Two worlds. God created not one world, but two. There's one for torment and one for eternal life. The religions out there that teach soul sleep, like the Seventh-day Adventists teach soul sleep, uh, or annihilation, mm. you die and you just become fish food yep. and you just simply cease to exist. But um, they refuse to believe in eternal torment because their humanistic thought says a loving God would not place any person to be tormented eternally. That's right. But that's a lie. Mm-hmm. The truth is, the real gospel truth is God, the most high, has created two worlds. One's eternal torment, one's eternal salvation. Mm-hmm. Everybody has that choice. That's why we're down here on this probationary tribulation of an earth to find the narrow gate provided to him, provided to us by him. It's not harsh, folks. It's just truth. Mm-hmm. What's harsh is the lies that we've been told. Right. But this is truth. How much more should your compassion be for other people who don't know the truth mm-hmm. when you read this? Yeah. If you think everybody's going to be saved, 
that good people are just good people. And if religious people are going to get saved, there's no need for them. There's no need for you to feel compassion for them and provide the truth. There's no need to feel compassion for yourself if you think you're saved once and you're always saved. Mm -hmm. Right? Or if you're a Calvinist, if you're a Baptist, Presbyterian, Calvinist, um, doctrine of devils, you come out of that and you believe that you were chosen by God, you were predetermined, you were predestined, and the others were not. That's a lie. Mm -hmm. We'll show you that. That's wrong. That's a, that's a man listening to demons creating a whole doctor that has led millions and millions astray. Mm -hmm. Along with that doctor of demons, they're tuliped, they're total depravity, they're unlimited, you know, grace, they're limited atonement. Christ's atonement was limited to just the elect, mm. <laughs> which were predetermined. Along with all that is their preservation of saints. Once saved, always saved. You could never lose that salvation. You put all those together, you have a cocktail that's leading you straight into that other world of eternal torment. Mm. But they don't know it because their hearts have been hardened and it's alienated from God. And it brings them into corruption and the ways of death. And it removes them from eternal life. I'm just telling you the truth. Baptists, Presbyterians, um, there's a host of other ones that come, that come out of Calvinism. False doctrine. Verse 51, For whereas you have said that the righteous are not many, but few, while the ungodly abound, hear the explanation for this. Verse 52, he says, If you have just a few precious stones, will you add to them lead and clay? Right? If you got some diamonds, are you going to put dirt on them? Mm -mm. It's not natural. You've got to look at nature. Ezra says, Lord, how could that be? And so he says, not only that, but ask the earth and she will tell you. Defer to her. She'll declare to you. Mm -hmm. Say to her, you produce gold. You produce silver, brass. Also iron, lead and clay. See, it all goes, it goes from the most precious to the worst. He says, but silver is more abundant than gold and brass than silver, and iron than brass, and lead than iron, and clay than lead. Judge, therefore, which things are precious and desirable, those that are abundant or those that are rare. I think we should all get that pretty good. Now, what this reminds me of is Daniel chapter 2. Mm -hmm. And Kapow, Mr. Kapow is going to read that, but... That's the generations from Babylon. That's starting from ne uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, who was called King of Kings. O King, thou art the head of gold. After him, all the kings of the earth became less and less precious and more crappy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you look around what we have today, we're in the crap stool, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're even beyond clay. I think we're just in the feces mm -hmm. mode. Um, so think about that. So, so the angels telling Ezra, you know, look around, ask Earth itself, because you're complaining that only a few are going to be saved, and the rest of the people aren't. And he's saying, look it. There's preciousness in gold and silver. And then it gets worse and worse. Are you going to take dirt and clay and feces and mix it up with your with your gold and your silver? No. See, it's just the it's it's nature itself tells you that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and not all dog all good dogs go to heaven. They have the opportunity to, see, but they don't all go. Um, will you read Daniel 2? I'd be happy. To. All right. Starting at verse 36. This was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, 
or the birds of the sky. He has given them into your hand and caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. And that you saw the feet and toes partly of the potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. But it will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay. They will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Yep. Yep. So there you have the biblical reference to the same thing, um, well, written around the same time Ezra's writing this stuff, around the same period, both are in Babylon, about what is plentiful is less, less worth uh, than what is rare is more precious. And so Ezra answers and he says, O sovereign Lord, what is plentiful is of less worth and what is more rare is more precious. That's why it's a narrow gate. That's why you're in this great tribulation to come out of it. That's why, like in last last week, we talked about the book of Revelation and those in white robes. And John asked the angel, who are these? Or the angel asked John, who are these? And he goes, you know, my Lord. Hmm. He says, these are they who came out of great tribulation. See, these are the ones that overcome through their testimony in the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. Amen? So, Amen. Those who do that are precious to God. You see, in John it says that if you have faith in the Messiah, you come to the Father. No man comes to the Father but through, but through Christ, through Messiah. But if a person does this, he gives them the power, the dunamis, the power to become sons of God. Mm -hmm. You see? Few do it, but it's possible. That's right. It's possible. He, he has not, God has not excluded any humans from that possibility. <clears throat> Only the human excludes himself. All right? Mm hmm Verse 59, he answered me and said, weigh within yourself what you have thought, for he who is what is hard to get <clears throat> rejoices more than he who has what is plentiful. Mm -hmm. um, and that reminded me of the pearl of great price. Not the Mormon book, but the, but the parable. Mm -hmm. In Matthew 13, uh, 44 through 50. Yes, starting with 30, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it is filled, 
They drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. See, in, in, these, in, the, in this, these parables right here, you also have the two worlds. You have the kingdom of heaven is like unto, uh, right? You have the kingdom of heaven. And then you also have the other world where you have, you're separated those trash fish mm. that are caught up in the net, the trash fish, and they're thrown into eternal torment. That's right. There is two places. No matter how much humanism gets into us, or, hey, that's not fair, or what do they do, how much? It is a fact, and it's a sobering truth. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you, I'm sorry? I said amen. And okay. when you brace that truth, embrace that truth, it does change how you think, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. Um, and that's amazing when you read those parables now in light of this. What is hard to get rejoices more than he who has what is plentiful. You see? Mm-hmm. And when you read that, the kingdom of heaven, it's like, it's, it's like deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Mm-hmm. You find that pearl uh, or, you, or, or, or whatever you want. It's in that, oh, there's buried treasure here. You go and you sell everything and buy that lot. Mm-hmm. And all your neighbors and family are going, what is wrong with you? You sold that beautiful house. You sold your Teslas? You sold, you you liquidated all your stocks and bonds to buy this one acre lot in the Arizona Strip? What's wrong with you? Well, you know that underneath that ground is treasure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See, that's what the kingdom of heaven's are like. All right. Verse 60, so also will be the judgment which I have promised. There's a judgment God has promised Mm -hmm. where he weighs in the balance, all of us. And he says, for I will rejoice over the few who shall be saved. Not not because he determined they would be saved, but because he provided a way for them to be saved and they did it. Because it is they, they, who have made my glory to prevail now. And through them, my name has now been honored. That's heavy, folks. Mm -hmm. Because that tells you right there what God thinks of you. We, all of us, and every every, you you listening to me, me, Ms. Kapow, we want to be they who made God's glory prevail now. That's right, yes. We want to be they whom his name has been honored now. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now. This is where we want to be. So if you will read Mark 8, 38, and then Luke 12, 22, 40. Okie dokie. There'll be good scripture backing for this. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. It's the same thing. God is proud and rejoices in those few because they give him honor to his name now. But in Mark, Christ says just the opposite will happen also. If you're ashamed of him and his words now, while you live here now in this matrix, He's going to be ashamed of you when he comes with us, the glory of his father and his angels. That's right. That's not the people we want to be? No. Okay, Luke 12. Starting with verse 22, says, And he said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds. 
And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? And do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them, whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third, and finds them so, blessed are those slaves." But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Wow. Folks, Luke twelve twenty two through 40, it behooves all of us to really get that into our spirit. Because it's like that's a key to honoring God now. Mm -hmm in this life. God will be proud and rejoice of those few because they've honored him now. This scripture here is key to that. Now you notice it's totally the opposite of the prosperity gospel. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's totally opposite of Kenneth Copeland Ministries. It's totally opposite of big mega churches and Hillsong and all that. Totally opposite. It behooves us to really get this in our spirit. It's totally opposite. This is a passage that Messiah gave us on how to honor him. And uh, it's just ignored. Mm -hmm. Just ignored. Uh, it, it doesn't apply to them. You know, God wants you to have the jet, right? Yeah. He's saying, be like the flower. Don't worry about what the world worries about. Because you know why he's saying that? Because this is nothing. It's over with, real quick. He wants you to endure for eternal life. Mm -hmm. How about Romans uh, 2, 7 through 9? Romans 2, 7 through 9 says, To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Once again, you have two worlds. You have a duality here. You have a punishment, and you have eternal life. Yeah. Heavy stuff, Miss Kapow. Yes, very heavy. God himself, I will rejoice over the few who shall be saved. The ones who find the narrow gate. <clears throat> like Ms. Kapow said, that's Christ himself. Christ is the door that you go through. Because it's they who've made his glory to prevail now. Through their life. They've, they've, they've washed their, their robes in his blood and have made them white. That's what Revelation says. 61, and I will not grieve over the multitude of those who perish. They, God, God, doesn't, God doesn't subscribe to the humanistic, all good dogs go to heaven. He says, I will not grieve over the multitude of those who perish. And the reason being, one of the reasons being here, let me interject this, is because he has provided the way. 
but they but they don't take it. And like we read last week, on that day, his patience and mercy, it's over, okay? Mm -hmm. Choose ye this day who you're going to serve. So I will not grieve over the multitude of those who perish, for it is they who are now like a mist and are similar to a flame and smoke. They're set on fire, they burn hotly, and then they're extinguished. Mm -hmm. They're gone. It's just like a little candle, folks. Ezra replies and he says, O earth, what have you brought forth? And if the mind is made out of dust, like the other created things, for it would have been better if the dust itself had not been born, so that the mind might not have been made from it. But now the mind grows with us, and therefore we are tormented because we perish and know it. Oh, let the human race lament, but let the beasts of the fields be glad. Let all who have been born lament, but let the four-footed beasts and the flocks rejoice, for it's much better with them than with us. They don't look for a judgment, nor do they know of any torment or salvation, the dual, the dual worlds, promised to them after death. You see, Ezra still is still not getting it. <laughs> He's still, you know, bless his heart. You know, we have hindsight. We have Christ. Mm -hmm. He's still not getting it. He's been told all these things. But now he's just going, hey, it's better. If, why'd you even create man if if we have this mind in us that's just unredeemable? You know, so few of us. Um, there's a real hell. There's a, there's a real place of torment. Torment or salvation. Verse 67, it says, For what does it profit us that we shall be preserved alive but cruelly tormented? <laughs> Right? So he's, he's not getting it. Uh, let's look at the prophet scriptures. Uh, what does it profit us that we shall be preserved alive but cruelly tormented? See, Ezra right there is telling you there is a eternal hell. It's not preached today, apparently. I don't go to those places, but apparently there's not a whole lot of churches and pastors that are preaching about an eternal hell. Mm -hmm. But there's an eternal hell, folks. Yeah. It's the ancient, whether you believe it or not, because you were taught by John MacArthur that it doesn't exist, whether you or John believe it or not is of little significance. Mm -hmm. Because the ancient Jews, you cannot deny that the ancient Jewish writings, they believed that. And why did they believe that? Because they weren't as smart as John MacArthur? No, because it's truth. God told them. That's right. They've known it all along. It's serious. <clears throat> For what does it profit us? First Samuel 12. It's a long one. I like this one, though. It's a good one. This says, um, verse 19, Then all the people said to Samuel, Oh, pray for your servants to the Lord your God, so that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, Do not fear. You have committed all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord. But serve the Lord with all your heart. You must not turn aside, for then you would go after futile things, which cannot profit or deliver, because they are futile. For the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you, but if you still do wickedly, both you and your king will be swept away. Wow. Talk about God's patience. Mm -hmm. uh, Job twenty one fifteen. Who is the Almighty that we should serve Him, and what would we gain if we entreat Him? What profit? What profit is it? What profit, Job? Well, I don't know if Job is saying this or one of the his advisors, but somebody in the Book of Job is saying what. Is the Almighty? What is God, and why should we serve Him? And what profit do we have if we pray to Him? It's 
probably a, a rhetorical question that they're asking. But um, the question is, what profit us if we're preserved alive but cruelly tormented? What profit is there? Uh, and Messiah himself said in Mark 8.36, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What good is it to gain all of this satanic nonsense <laughs> for, I don't know, even if you're on the far end of living life eight, in your 80s with bad knees and a bad back and dementia, and then it's over, and then the rest of it is mm. eternal torment. I mean, come on. Yeah. That's not even, that's not even, <laughs> you know, that's not even something to, to, it's not even apples and apples here. So Ezra continues in 68, he says, for all who have been born are involved in iniquities and all are full of sins and burdened with transgressions. And he's right, because that's what Paul said in Romans also, right? Mm -hmm. All have sinned. And if we were not to come into judgment after death, perhaps it would have been better for us. In other words, it would have been better if we just weren't born. If we, if we, God would just ended it with Adam and been done. And uh, the angel answered Ezra and said, when the Most High made the world and Adam and all who have come from him, he first prepared the judgment and the things that pertain to the judgment. Now, this is beautiful, folks. Don't get hung up on the word judgment like the great white judgment, he's going to judge you. Mm -hmm. He's talking about everything that entails the Messiah in that judgment. The choosing of him or rejecting of him. Say, the most high, when he made this earth and Adam and then every person, you and I, who have come from the seed of man, before all of that, He's made preparation. Mm -hmm. That is predetermined. That's what it means when he says he predetermined. He already prepared the way. He's predetermined the way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. God's all-knowing. And he made the way, put the things in place, from the beginning. That is his foreknowledge. Okay? When he has a foreknowledge of you being the elect, his foreknowledge is that he pre prepared the way long time ago. Mm -hmm. And you accepted that, found that way, and to become the elect. Mm -hmm. That's what it means to have the foreknowledge of God. It wasn't a crystal ball that he said, oh, Kathy Smith is going to be saved. No matter what happens, she's going to become a Christian. It, was, it wasn't, it's not a crystal ball. It's I provided a way for Kathy Smith and Kathy Smith found it. Amen. Okay? Praise God. Acts 2.23, Miss Bell. Acts 2.23 says, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So, um, it, it's, it's Peter talking, I believe here, the second chapter of Acts. Mm -hmm. He's talking about Christ, the Messiah. Now, notice these words, him or Christ being delivered mm -hmm. by the determinate counsel that determinate council are not the Jews or the Sanhedrin. The determinate council is the council of God that he first prepared when he made the world in Adam and all who came through him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Christ being delivered by the determinate, it was already determined long ago. God's council determined it and foreknowledge of God. God had foreknowledge. He knew it from the beginning. In Ezra, it says, when the Most High made the world and Adam and all who came from him, he first prepared 
the judgment and the things that pertain to the judgment. Mm -hmm. Peter says, Christ being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Mm -hmm. God knew and determined Messiah to be delivered. Why? So the few could find the narrow gate. That's beautiful. It is. Amen. So Peter says, you, 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 now you've taken Messiah with your wicked hands and you, and you crucified and killed him. But it was determined with the foreknowledge of God. God's own counsel determined that. It, see, it's easy to read over that. But when you read the ancient scriptures like Ezra, bam, these things start popping up, don't they? Mm -hmm. um, Strong's Concordance, the word, Greek word is prognisko. Probably you get the word prog prognosis. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's foreknowledge. And it means to know beforehand or to foresee, to foreknow or ordain beforehand, right? Now, let me tell you something that's wrong in Strong's Concordance. Mm. They give a description, they say, to have foreknowledge beforehand, right? And that's true, because God knew beforehand, had foreknowledge. But it says to foreknow of those whom God elected to salvation, to predestinate. Now, that's a Calvinist doctrine of demons, predestination. They believe that God predestined certain people to be elect and others to die in hell. Mm -hmm. And it's simply not true. That doctrine of demons leads to all kinds of pride and arrogancy, That's and right. it leads them to the road to hell. Mm -hmm. they, they get so, like, like John MacArthur, they get so arrogant because they're the elect. And then, you know what? Your children are elected too because they're born and they go to your Calvinist church and then their grandchildren go to your Calvinist church and everybody's fine. And they can never lose their salvation. Mm -hmm. What a deal. Sounds like a doctrine of demons, doesn't it? Because yeah. that's not how it is. There, there's no trash fish in that demon, in that uh, doctrine, is there? Mm -mm. Um, Yet it elevates man. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. And they say, well, it's just by the grace of God he elected me. I can't help it if he didn't elect my neighbor. Mm-mm. And then someone said, well, what about um, evangelism? Well, we still got to evangelize because we don't know who's elected or not. We don't know who's predetermined, so we got to tell the gospel because if they're predetermined, they're going to... But that don't make sense because if they're predetermined, why give the gospel? Because they're going to get saved anyway because God already predetermined, right? Mm -hmm. It's a doctrine of demons, folks. There's many, many churches out there that have a Calvinist-based theology. Theology is nothing more than man's philosophy applied to scriptures, and it's wrong. Okay, so Strong's Concordance here, this definition is wrong. Those whom God elected, that's, that's not true. What happened is God had foreknowledge beforehand. When he made the world and Adam and all come from him, he foreknowledge, he knew that he was going to send his only begotten son to provide the way to eternal salvation that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's right. Not just the elect few, that some crazy psycho God says, you're going to be elected, the rest of them are not. See, and this elevates Christ as our Savior, as God made flesh. Exactly. It, it honors God. Exactly, and not some lotto ball up in heaven that happened to have your name on it. Oh, we're breaking it down today, Ms. Powell. Mm -hmm. Stepping on some toes. But and you know, I, that also shows us that um, how do you determine false doctrine from true doctrine? If the doctrine actually exalts God, then it has to be true. Mm -hmm. Anything that exalts man has got to be false. It's false. Just like our teaching on the, the uh, Daniel 7th week. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, yeah. When we did that teaching on Daniel's seventh week, seventh week it, it only exalted Christ. He was the Messiah who broke that covenant, that old covenant, and started the new one in his blood. Amen, yes. But the modern-day prophecy wizards want to lay that scripture at the feet of Antichrist mm -hmm. and make him the one breaking a covenant with Israel. Mr. Gay Pride Israel. 
Tel Aviv, Israel, the biggest gay pride. Right? Come on, people. Wake up. Mm-hmm. First Peter 1 Peter 1.1. 1. 1 Peter 1, 1 says, To those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen. Shall I read two? Yes. According to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be with yours, be with be yours in the fullest measure. This is beautiful. A couple of things. First Peter says, um, first he says, Hi, I'm Peter. I'm an apostle <laughs> of Jesus Christ to the strangers, and the King James it says strangers scattered throughout, and he names these cities. It's almost a code word that you're a sojourner, you don't belong here. It is a code word. Mm-hmm. Those who don't belong here, those who understand that this is a matrix and a phony system, when you see that word to the strangers, you know he's talking about you because this ain't your home. That's right. Oh, praise God. And the version you read out of it, NASB? Aliens. says aliens. Same thing. You're an alien to the alien. It's somebody, it's a foreigner. It's somebody who doesn't belong. Why would Peter write that? To the people who don't belong scattered through blah, blah, blah. Why would he write that? Because they don't belong there. Mm -hmm. You don't belong here. That's right. We're in this world, but we're not of it. Amen. Because there's two worlds he created. Turtle torment, turtle salvation. We want to belong to another world. Yes, amen. And then Peter says, in the King James, he says, elect. He calls Mm -hmm. them elect. Right? According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And that's where the Calvinists stop. They go, oh, they're elect according to foreknowledge of God the Father. God knew they were going to be elect. That's not what Peter says. Peter's saying elect according to foreknowledge of God. What else? Through the sanctification of their spirit by God's spirit. Mm -hmm. They weren't just elected. They became elect according to what? God's eternal plan. Mm -hmm. Back to Ezra, when the Most High made the world in Adam and all who have come from him, he first prepared the judgment and the things that are pertaining to it. Peter says, according to that foreknowledge of God, that's why they're elect, mm-hmm. because God provided the way. And through the self- sanctification of their spirit, they became a new person. Unto what? Obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ Jesus. That's what God had the foreknowledge of. Hallelujah. And then Peter says, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. You're Mm -hmm. not going to have grace and peace, and it's not going to be multiplied until you understand that. Mm -hmm. Amen, yes. Woo! That's preaching right there. This is meat and potatoes. Yes, it is. This is meat and potatoes. Once again, let me reiterate. I hope this is real clear. You, if you're saved, you are elect. Not because God foreknew that you would be the elect, but because God, according to his foreknowledge, provided the way through Messiah for you to become elect. Mm -hmm. God's foreknowledge came in his provision for our sins. You are elect because of the sanctification of your spirit through his spirit. He changes you. Mm -hmm. You're not once saved, always saved. You change. You get sanctified. Yes. You are elect because of your obedience or your faith, your trust, your peace in the blood of Messiah for your salvation. Then and only then is grace given to you and your peace be multiplied. Amen. So you stop right there. Right there's a sermon of the year. Amen. Right there. Praise God. Yes. Sermon of the year right there. Okay. And now understand from your own words, for you have said that the mind grows with us. And for this reason, therefore, those who dwell on earth shall be tormented. Because though they had understanding, they committed iniquity. And though they received the commandments, they did not keep them. And though they obtained the law, they dealt unfaithfully with what they received. You get what's being said here? 
Ezra's going, we should have never been born. Our mind is, is evil and it grows evil with us. This is not fair. We should have been born. He says, look it. They had understanding and they still committed iniquity. They received commandments and they won't keep them. They won't follow God. And he's not saying because, oh, they went to the Baptist church or they went to Calvary Chapel and they heard. No, nature itself tells them about God. Right, Ms. Beth? That's right. How about Romans 1? Okay. And this is um, 1 so, through 32. It's a long one. Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through the prophets in, his, in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are called, all of the call, ha, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers, making request, and perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, But the righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world has invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the uncorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, and four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who was blessed forever. Amen. And for this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function of that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to, those, to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Woo! Wow. <clears throat> right there is the answer to all humanistic thought. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. 
Ezra, now understand from your own words that you have said the mind grows with us. You know, why were we born? How come there's gonna how come all these people are gonna go to hell? And only a few find the truth. It's not fair. And then Ezra says, For this reason, those who dwell on earth shall be tormented, because they had understanding. They committed iniquity, although they had it. And they received the commandments, and they didn't keep them. They obtained the law, and they were unfaithful what they received. Paul almost says that verbatim in Romans. Mm -hmm. And it even expands on it about the lust of the flesh and homosexuality and, and, and lesbianism and and, and God turns them over to a reprobate mind. Oh, dear God. Because they're going to go to a place of eternal torment. Mm. Because they refuse to find the foreknowledge what was foreordained for them. You're not special, and I'm not special. Mm. We just happen to find it and stick with it and sticking with it continually because I believe this stuff mm -hmm. wholeheartedly. I don't believe the doctrines of men. And we're going to wrap it up in verse 73. Ezra says, what then will they have to say in the judgment? Ezra doesn't say that. I'm sorry. The, the angel's telling. He's continuing on about those who commit iniquity, even though they have understanding. He says, what then will they have to say in the judgment? How are they going to defend themselves? Or how will they answer in the last times? Mm. Remember the sheep and goats? Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Get out of here. I never knew you. Mm. Go in darkness where there's gnashing and wailing. Right? Mm -hmm. How are they going to answer when the way was provided for them and they refused to even look at it? Or how are they going to answer when they dealt unfaithfully with what they received? You know what that means? That means some people have received the truth and then doctored it up like John Calvin did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. What then will they say? 74, for how long the time is that the Most High has been patient with those who inhabit the world. He's been, back then he was patient with them. And he's, this was 400 years before Christ, about 2,400 years ago. And he's still patient today in 2019. Someday he won't be. And it says, and not for their sake. Not for their sake has he been patient. He's not like, oh, well, I know that little Johnny Smith is going to become the elect because John Calvin taught that he's going to become the elect. And he, then once he becomes the elect and he says that prayer at Calvary Chapel, he's always saved. Not for their sake, but because of the times which he has foreordained. The Moeds. Yes. Get that in your head. The reason why he's patient is because of the Times in which he has foreordained. When he made Adam in the world and all that came from him, he first prepared the judgment and the things that pertain to the judgment. Mm -hmm. That's where it's at. This is what is foreordained, folks. Not you as the elect. There is no predetermined elect. Little Johnny wasn't predetermined to come to Christ while little Sally, no matter what she did, is just going to die and go to hell. You see what a doctrine of demons that crap is? Mm. It's crap. Ezra destroys Calvinism and all that other crap. And I'm just talking about Calvinism now, but there's a lot of doctrine of demons out there. This is truth. John 3, 16. John 3, This is what is foreordained, the propitiation of Messiah. Go ahead, Ms. Powell, give it to 21 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Mm -hmm. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed 
in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Key, key, key scripture. Mm-hmm. John 3.16, these idiots at football games tattoo it on their face or have it on their t-shirts, right? Mm. This is not a little Sunday school scripture. This destroys Calvinism along with Ezra. This is what is foreordained, that God loved the world, the humans in it, that he gave his son. He gave the Messiah. It says that the predetermined elect believe? No, that whosoever has faith in him would not perish, would have everlasting life. There's the two worlds again. He created two worlds, eternal punishment, eternal life. There it is right there in that short little sentence is the gospel. That's what Ezra, this is what he's writing about. And it says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn it. You said in the NSB, I love the way it's written, judgment. He uses the word judgment there. And King James says condemn, but judgment. What does Ezra say? He first prepared the judgment, the things that pertain to the judgment, way back when. He didn't send his son to judge the world when when Christ came in the flesh, but that the world through him might be saved. That's through his blood. That's the new covenant. And all those who believe on him are not condemned. They're not judged. But guess what? If you don't believe in him, you're already judged already because you didn't believe in his name. Mm-hmm. He's the only begotten Son of God. He's He's God made flesh. You didn't believe in it, and this is the judgment. And that is the commandment. That is the commandment. That's the commandment to believe in the Son of God. Yeah. And if you don't, you're already condemned. The people who don't are already condemned because light came to them, but they love the darkness because the deeds are evil, and light sheds light on evil. And knowing that God's going to reprove you of those evil deeds. But he that, like you read, practices truth. That's right. King James says, doeth truth. NASB says, practices truth. Be doers of the word. Yeah, you got to practice it, man. You got to do it. You got to be it. You come to the light and your deeds are manifest. Everybody sees it. And they are brought in in God. Mm-hmm. That is being foreordained. And we're going to end there. Verse 75 will start next week, Lord willing. And uh, man, listen to this show again. Listen to it two times. Listen to it three times. Get it in your spirit. Understand the truth behind this. It is key. It is key to eternal life. Understanding this. All right? All right. Anything else, Miss Bain? No. Okay. Good night. Shall be. I yelled and I screamed Till it spoke things of sea All just to get your Attention on me I whispered in your ears I use love, I use fear All just to get you You listen to me
And for the life of me, I just can't figure out 